Let's begin here in chapter 3 of Hebrews at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 and 2, give you an introduction, and move into our study. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. And so in the first two chapters of the book of Hebrews, the writer has been presenting Jesus Christ as greater. Uh, He mentioned in chapter 1 that um, Jesus is greater than the prophets. And when you start considering all the names of the prophets, there's so many prophets in the Old Testament, it's very difficult for us to even remember every one of them. But he's saying that Jesus is greater than Samuel, he's greater than than Elijah, Elisha, he's greater than, than Jonah, he's greater than Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, he, he's greater than all of them. So he's pointed out that Jesus is greater than prophets. He's also pointed out that Jesus is greater than the angels. Now, anybody is greater than the angels, right? Oh, I was thinking of baseball. <laughs> Forgive me. Forgive me for a moment. <laughs> Fallen angels. Um, <laughs> what a burn. Um, there, there are three angels mentioned in Scripture. Um, and one of them is Lucifer. The other is Michael, and then there's Gabriel. But there are hordes or multitudes of angels that are spoken of and, and referenced in Scripture, and they're mighty, they're, they're awesome, and, and, and all of that. And yet Jesus is not only greater than prophets, He's also greater than any angel. And so what he's doing here in chapter 3 is he's continuing this theme because he is pointing out, and we'll see this in chapter 3, that Jesus is greater than a man by the name of Moses. Now, we need to remember uh, something about Moses. Moses is one of Israel's greatest heroes. Uh, He was Israel's great deliverer. He was their great leader. He was was known as the one who gave the law, the lawgiver. When you read the Bible and you read uh, concerning the introduction of Moses to us, and you're in the book of of Exodus, you see in chapter 3 that Moses was tending his father-in-law Jethro's sheep, and God had had, uh, communicated or revealed himself to him. It says in Exodus 3, 1 through 4, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn? So when the Lord saw that, he turned aside to look. God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. So the call of Moses is deeply embedded in the religious consciousness of the nation of Israel. Moses was a great deliverer of Israel, and Moses is greatly honored. And so what he's pointing out is that Jesus is greater than prophets, greater than angels, and greater than one of the great and mighty heroes of the nation of Israel. He is greater. Now, The writer is recognizing Moses is great, but he's pointing out that Jesus is even greater still. And the reason that Jesus is greater is because Moses pointed to Messiah. Now, we know that Moses wrote Genesis to Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Old Testament. And in those books, he prophetically pointed to the one who is Messiah. He wrote Genesis. And in chapter 3, verse 15, there's a first prophecy of Messiah where it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Speaking of Messiah, he shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. In the last book of the first five books, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 15, he had said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, and him, he said, you shall hear. And so, in the early days in the, of, the, of the early disciples, they, they saw that, that Moses had prophetically pointed to Messiah. In John 1, 45, for example, it says that Philip found Nathanael, said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. 
Later on in John chapter 5, verses 45 and 46, we read Jesus saying, Do not think that I'll accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For, Jesus said, he wrote of me. And so Moses is the lawgiver, but he also gave prophetic words concerning Messiah. And so we're going to see in this passage, in this chapter, how he's going to point out, how the writer's going to point out that Jesus is greater than Moses. And so he begins in verse 1 by saying in chapter 3, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Now, I'm going to break it down a little bit for you. He's not speaking racially when he says holy brethren. He's speaking spiritually. He's saying, my fellow Christians. Now, the Jewish brethren, remember this is it's the book of Hebrews. The Jewish brethren would especially need to receive this admonition because it would be easy for the Jewish believer to look down on their Gentile brethren. Remember how Paul said it to the Ephesians, a Gentile church in chapter 2, verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. So the Hebrews, the Jewish believers, could think themselves to be superior to the Gentiles, and so they need to hear this. The Jewish brethren need to receive this admonition. And he's speaking of them in verse 1 as partakers of the heavenly calling. Now, this speaks of the origin of the invitation of salvation. The call, the heavenly calling originates with God in heaven, but heaven is the ultimate goal. So the calling originates in heaven, but the destination is heaven. In Philippians 3, 13 and 14, Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward that which is ahead, I press on toward the goal to, the, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So our ultimate goal is heaven, Philippians 3.20. Our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the call originates, this heavenly call originates with God, but heaven is the goal. Now, he's saying you're holy brethren. Why would he say that? He, he's saying this is because you desire to be with Jesus and you desire to live godly lives. You are already re recognized or regarded as heaven citizens. So let go of earthly things that fall short of the Lord. Why cling to to earthly rituals and symbols, and miss what God has for you. You see, there's a temptation for the Jewish believers to return to the law. And this is what he's pointing out. Why do you want to have these earthly rituals and symbols? You're going to miss what God has for you now. You see, these ceremonies were intended to bring you to Jesus. Again, when he wrote to the Colossians, he said in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These, he said, are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, reality, however, is found in Christ. Why are you getting caught up with rituals? Why do you get caught up with these things? We've had people before who've come, and I'll say this briefly, who will say, you guys are, are Sabbath breakers. You're not worshiping God on Shabbat. You're supposed to be observing Saturdays and all. But one person regards one day as more important than the other. The bottom line is it's all pointing to Jesus and our rest that we have in him. And so he's saying you need to consider this. He says, notice again in verse 1, Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Consider. Pay serious attention to him. Let your mind remain on Jesus Christ. So consider him. Now notice how he calls him an apostle. He's called apostle because that's a title uh, related to a messenger. And he is God's highest messenger to man. And he is totally sufficient for our salvation. 
and everything else is no longer needed. Jesus is sufficient in every way. He is the one who gives to us everything that we need. And as high priest, um, he is called the high priest of our confession. Now, as we're going through the book of Hebrews, one of the reasons why I felt led to, to take us through this book is because it's going to rest a lot in Old Testament. And, and I haven't taught certain books of the Old Testament for quite some time. This gives me the opportunity to, to look back at some of those books and to point some things out. But he's called here the, the high priest of our confession. In other words, he is all we will ever need. He is uh, our confession of faith. When you got saved, you confessed Jesus Christ as Lord. And so our confession of faith is in Christ unto salvation. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, if believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And so he is the high priest of our confession. We have regarded him, openly confessed him as our Savior. And he is that high priest of our confession. In verse 2, he goes on to say, who was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses also was faithful in all his, speaking of God's, in all God's house. Jesus was faithful to his father, and he is faithful to the work that he had been called to do. When you read your scriptures, you'll see him saying that. He, he completely performed the task that he was sent to perform. Jesus performed whatever his father had sent him to do, providing salvation for us. In John 10, he was speaking on one occasion. It's found in verses 17 and 18. And he said, my father loves me because I laid down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. And this command I've received from my father. I am laying my life down voluntarily I'm doing the will of my father. The command I received came from my father. Jesus is pointed out as being completely faithful. He is the one who is faithful to him. And so Moses, verse 2, was also faithful in all God's house. So what's he doing? Well, he's comparing Jesus with Moses. Why is that? Because the Jews had tremendous admiration for Moses. Now, notice he says, Moses was faithful in God's house. That's a quotation out of Numbers in the Old Testament. Chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. He said, listen to my words. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak face to face. That speaks of having a communion or a close relationship. I speak face to face clearly, not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? He is faithful. So Moses was faithful to the one who appointed him, and Jesus was. Jesus always did his Father's will perfectly. He was the one who could say, even to his own brothers and sisters, he could say to his mother, which of you can convict me of sin? Which of you can convict me of sin? Now, if you went home and you did that to your mom and dad, which one of you could, or a brother or a sister, which one of you? They'd stand in line, you know, and one after another would convict you of sin, right? So Jesus was able to ask that question, which of you can? What, what person on the face of the earth can convict me of sin? The answer, obviously, is none. Why? Because he did his Father's will perfectly. In John 8, 29, he who sent me is with me. The Father hasn't left me alone. Why? For I always do those things that please him. So Jesus was faithful, and that's the point he's making. Moses was faithful. Jesus is faithful. Now, he goes on to say in verse 3, for this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch 
as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And so Moses receives honor because he's great. But Moses was only a member of the household of God. Moses didn't own the house. He was what is called a steward. He took care of the goods that someone else owned. On the other hand, Jesus is the one who built and owns the house. He's a builder and the owner of the entire universe. Everything belongs to him. In John 1, 3, it says, All things, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In Colossians 1, 16 and 17, By him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. All things consist. That means that even when Jesus died on the cross, the cross that he was crucified on was held together by him. That means that the ground that that cross was dropped into, that was able to hold that cross in place, was held together by him. That means that the nails that were driven into his hands and feet, even those nails were held together by him. That shows the greatness of the work of God in that he held all those things together while dying on our behalf. He's greater. That's why he's greater than Moses. Moses was somebody who lived within the house, but he didn't own the house. Moses was just a servant within the house. And Jesus is the one who holds all things together. And Jesus is the one who built the church. Jesus is the one who built the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians, the Bible tells us in chapter 3, verse 16, do you not know that you are the temple of God? The Spirit of God dwells in you. This is something that I think we ought to rest on for just a moment. Every born-again believer in here, you really need to grab hold of this, and I think some have failed to remember this, and it's one of the things the enemy uses against us constantly, is we forget who we are. We forget that we are God's temple. We forget that God's, <laughs> that God's Spirit himself dwells in you. Wherever you go and whatever you do, God is dwelling in you as you're going and doing. Now, if you kept that in mind, sometimes we wouldn't go certain places and we wouldn't do certain things. Because wherever we go and whatever we do, we're bringing him along with us. And that helps you to make choices as to what to do and where to go and who to be with. It helps you to know that. So if you tell the Lord, it's a Friday night, I'm kind of bored, I'm going to the bar. You want to go? And he says, right on, I could use a beer, then go. But most of the time, that's not going to happen, right? Most of the time, it's not. You are the temple of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God dwells within you. Wherever you go, whatever you do, he's with you. He's always with you. He's always with you. And when you become aware of that, your life changes. Your life is more aware of his presence. And you become aware of what it means to worship in in all things and to do everything that you can to please him. You begin to learn that. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. The house was built by Jesus himself. Every house is built by some man. That gives to us an insight because when it says every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God, that helps us understand the whole, uh, one of the aspects of creation, and it helps us realize that, that every design has a designer. When you go through some of the areas in, in, here in California, especially in Southern California, it seems that, that if there's an empty parcel of, of, of land, somebody thinks that's a crime, so they want to build a house on it now. So, I mean, they're paving, you know, where there's an old song, paved, para paved paradise and put in a parking lot. That, there's a lot of truth to that now, right? I mean, you, you can't go to empty land and just see it because they're trying to put dwelling places everywhere. But when you drive by, just think of it like this. This is kind of how I'm, I'm simple in this, but if you drive by, 
and you see a parcel of land and then you start seeing construction and then finally you see a dwelling place there, you would never argue that that dwelling place created itself. You would never do that. You would say, well, that parcel of property had to have uh, somebody who was an architect, a designer, somebody had to come and build it. And you understand that even houses have to have builders. The universe has a builder. That's the whole point he's making. Every house is built by some man, but he who built all things is God. Moses is a member of the household, but Jesus built the house. The house belongs to him. He's the one who has built it. He's the one who created Israel. He called Israel into existence. Moses was only a part of the nation of Israel. Jesus built the church, and the church is his dwelling place. He's the builder. He's the one who furnishes. He's the one who equips and prepares. He's the one who makes it ready. He is the one who makes everything ready for a person or a thing. He's the one who constructs. He's the one who, who completely adorns and equips. And so what he's saying here is that Jesus planned and he built and he furnished the house. And as a builder, he's greater than anything that he used to build, including Moses. When it says again in verse 4, every house is built by someone, he who built all things is God, he's pointing out Jesus is superior to Moses. Why? Because Jesus is God in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. John chapter 1, verse 1. He goes on in verse 14 of John 1 and says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is superior to Moses. Jesus, he's saying, is God in the flesh, the one who built all things. Now, Moses, verse 5, indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. Moses, verse 5, was faithful. Moses is an example in the Old Testament of a man who was wonderfully submitted to God. But he wasn't God's unique son. Jesus is called in Scripture the only begotten son. In 1 John 4, 9, this, the, in this the love of God is manifested toward us. God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Jesus is the only begotten. What we are is adopted. We've been brought into the family. Romans eight fifteen says, the spirit you receive doesn't make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. By the Holy Spirit, we call him Abba. When you go to Israel, and some of you have, and you probably have heard this, and if you ever go, you will hear this. The word Abba is a, a, a term of endearment. Uh, you'll be walking, and a, a child will be running behind their daddy. And you'll hear the, the little, little one, we've heard it so many times, they'll say, Abba, Abba, Abba is daddy. And so when, when Paul tells us it's by the Holy Spirit that we call God our father, you need to remember something. And I'll say this briefly. This isn't in my notes, but it doesn't matter. You didn't know that. <laughs> um, when you read the Old Testament, God is, is revealed in, in various titles, titles, you know, he, he is the Lord who heals. He's the Lord who is our shepherd. He is the mighty God. He, he is the, you can, he's the everlasting. There's so many titles, descriptions of him. One time that I can think of it, I, I may be wrong in the numbers, but there's one time I can remember where in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, you are the Lord, you, you O God, are our father. Uh, you are the potter, and you are a father. And so Isaiah speaks of God as a potter and a father. Uh, but that's in terms, using terms related to um, the 
fact that he's a creator of all things. He is a father in the sense that he creates all things. In the New Testament, when you look at, at, at the Lord Jesus Christ, when he gives to us a, a model of prayer, we refer to it today as our father, the our father. But that was a revelation that was deeper than what the Old Testament saints had. They saw him as creator. They saw him as the one who put all things but there was into existence. They didn't see him as the one who was tenderly loving them. They didn't see that. That was revealed to them through Jesus Christ. When Jesus came, he showed us what God is like. He showed us that he's tender. When he scooped up children and blessed them, when, when he got angry when someone harmed another person, when he hated the, not hated, but when he was angry over the religious hypocrisy, he showed us the kind of God that we worship. And you need to start seeing this. And sometimes what happens is because we may not have had a good father, it's hard for us to understand that God he is a good father, that God is a loving father, that God is a caring father, that God is a providing father, that like a shepherd picks up a sheep and carries them in his arms, he carries us. We have to understand him that way. And so Moses was one who revealed things of God, but Jesus showed us what God is like. Moses was a servant in the house of God, but Jesus was the owner of the house. It belonged to him. And so we have a picture of him as one who was the only begotten son of God, but we have been brought into his family. He says in verse 6, Christ as son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Over his own house. He's speaking of the church. Again, you already know this, but I put it in my notes just to remind us. We're the church, and the church is in this building. We're his temple. But he's speaking about us being his house. We are his temple. Notice, I want you to see this, if we hold fast. Now, when he speaks concerning we are his temple, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. We are his temple when we receive Christ. And the fact that we receive Christ is a transformed life. It is a permanent change of heart what he's speaking about is genuine conversion and he's warning them to make sure that they are truly converted there's nothing wrong with you spending some soul searching time i've done it many times do i really belong to him Am I really saved? That was especially true when I first got saved. But there have been times in my life when I've actually said, Lord, am I just, am I just saying things? Or do I believe those things? And I've had many, many opportunities over the years to examine my heart. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says it like this. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith Test yourselves. Do you know yourselves that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless indeed you're disqualified. Do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know you're saved? How do you know you're saved? The spirit of the Lord bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. There's an awareness within me in the deepest recess of my soul that I belong to him. There is something that is not emotional. It's something that's factual. The scripture says, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. And I have believed. But I've demonstrated my faith by walking with Christ for 53 years. For 53 years this December. Has it been a perfect? Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. I waited. No. I was waiting and I was disappointed. <laughs> when I have to actually think about that, when did I get saved? It'll be 54 years 
uh, in December. And um, has it always been easy? No. Have I always been a glowing testimony? Absolutely not. Have there been times if you ran across me when I was younger on the street, would you have thought I was a Christian? Probably no. Probably no. Why? Because after God catches a fish, he cleans it. And sometimes it takes a while for that fish to get cleaned. Some of you understand what I mean. He, it takes time to clean the habits, to clean the mental kinds of obstructions, the attitudes, the, the way of being, where you get to the point where you start admitting things that you wouldn't admit before when you begin to, instead of arguing, well, that's just the way I am, and if you don't like it, that's too bad, you get to the point where you say, I'm sorry that you don't like it. I, I want to be better than it than that and for me it's been a process of 54 years for God to clean this this whale really is a big old fish that he's got a con <laughs> I know a whale this in a fish I'm just using an example examine your own heart where do you stand with Jesus tonight where do you stand with him really I've met guys who have pretended they're Christian so they, they could hook up with a woman take advantage of her and leave her. I've met guys like that. Oh, yeah, I go to church. Yeah, I love Jesus. And then once they get what they want, they just dump them. I've seen that. It's a heartbreak, but it's true. Sometimes we claim to be what we're not. So I think it's a good thing for us to realize that if we are the temple of God, um, that it's going to be demonstrated by not just a temporary, but a permanent change of heart, a, a genuine conversion, there will always be people attending Bible studies who aren't born again. And, and sometimes we, we have that even in our own fellowship. Jesus uh, taught a lot of parables in Matthew 13. And one of the parables that he gave is called the parable of the wheat and the tares. And in Matthew 13, he said this in verses 24 through 26. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, the tares also appeared. Tares were, it's called darnel, it's, it, it has the appearance of wheat, but it, it's just a counterfeit. It looks like it, but you don't know. You don't know that it's called darnel or tares until all the wheat has come to maturity. And then you can compare the wheat with the darnel, and you can see this is a weed, but this is genuine, and that's the parable. And so it goes on to explain this later. It says in Matthew 13, verses 36 through 38, Jesus sent the multitude away, went into the house. His disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. And so the point he's making is that within the church, there'll be those who are confessing to be Christian, but in fact, they're not. And that happens in every Bible study, every time a church service, that there are people who claim to be Christians when in fact, they're not. And after a while, when that, when that Darnell, when that weed comes to full maturity, it's demonstrated by the fact that they don't cling to Christ. They haven't been permanently changed. That's why it's important for us not to be paranoid, but to be aware. Because the phony will be scattered amongst the genuine. Now, a genuine believer can be tempted to return to their old way of life. They can battle with old desires, but they don't return permanently. Jesus in John 8, 31 and 32 said to the Jews that believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In 1 Timothy 4.16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. In 1 John 2.24, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. 
So we, we reveal our real relationship with God because we continue in Christ. And so that's the point he's making. Christ was the son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. We continue thus demonstrating that we've been saved. Now, let's see how far I can go. <laughs> I'm going to try, I really am. Verse 7, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And so what he does is he introduces an Old Testament quotation. This is Psalm 95. Now, the reason I get kind of slow on this is because I wanted to develop something with you. So I'm going to do what I can to develop it. And at a proper place, I'll stop if I don't conclude the study today. Because I want to point something to you that is, is, is not necessarily what he's saying here, but it's worth looking at. I want you to see... Verse 7, I want to show you something there. Notice how he writes, as the Holy Spirit says. That's a very important phrase. As the Holy Spirit says. This reveals to us that the Holy Spirit is a person. There are those who speak of the Spirit as energy or a force. You can speak to people like Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, they, they will say that. That the Holy Spirit is not a person. They will say to you, the Holy Spirit is an energy. It's a force of some sort. Like the wind has a force. And they will, they will do I've had many conversations with people who believe that. But here's the thing I want to point out. The Holy Spirit is a person, not an energy. Why? Because only a person speaks. Energy doesn't speak. You don't walk up to the light to turn it on and it says, do you want to turn on? It, 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 doesn't talk, it doesn't talk to you. Only a person has personality, right? Only a person can speak. And I want to point that out because it says the Holy Spirit says. So when you go through the scriptures, and I'll just give you a few of this. I want you to see this. Now the Holy Spirit is a person. Acts 8, 29, the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. Acts 10, 19, while Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Acts 13, verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. The Holy Spirit is a person. We are called Trinitarians because we believe in Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There are three persons in the one Godhead. And the scripture speaks of the spirit in this way as a person. And the point he's making is King David didn't write out of human inspiration this psalm. The Holy Spirit is the one who inspired Psalm 95. He's saying that the Bible is not the work of man's ingenuity, but the Bible has been inspired by God's Holy Spirit. 2 Samuel 23, 2. The spirit of the Lord spoke by me. His word was on my tongue. Second Peter 1, 20 and 21. Above all, you must understand no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So what the Holy Spirit had to say to the Jews a thousand years earlier still applied at that time. The Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. You see, you have the ability of hearing and responding to what he's saying to you. And so we pray, God, move our hearts. Listen, when you come to a Bible study, when you come to church, when you read your scriptures, here's a good practice for you. This is what I do when I prepare studies. This is what I do when I read. Father, speak to me through your word. Prepare your heart. Father, speak to me. I want to see, open my eyes to see wondrous things from your law. I want, I want you to reveal something to me of yourself today. I'm not just going to read it because Christians do devotions or, or believers read Bibles. 
I want you to speak to me. And when you go to church, I think Don said something like this the other day when he came on Sunday. Why do you come to church? Do you come to hear from God? Well, that's why you do. You come to hear from the Lord. Psalm 119.36, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. So he's saying, the Holy Spirit is speaking, and don't ignore what he's saying. Turn to God today. So he uses the children of Israel as an example of those who didn't listen. And he's pointing to the side. He said, they continually tested the Lord in the 40 years of wilderness wanderings. Now, they had, been brought, they had been in bondage in Egypt. God brought deliverance to them. How did he do this? I'll just remind you. He brought upon Egypt 10 plagues, and then they left. After they left, they became thirsty. So he gave them water from a rock. The Bible says that he daily gave them manna to sustain them, provided for them in every way. Deuteronomy 29.5, During the 40 years I led you through the desert, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet, but you women still wanted new clothes and sandals, but that's a different story. <laughs> he went before them. He met with them in the tabernacle. He gave them his law. He defeated their enemies. He preserved them in every way possible. But what did they do? In spite of all of this, they hardened their hearts against him. When it was time for them to enter into what was called the land of promise, what did they do? They, they rebelled. Numbers 13 speaks of 12 spies who represent the 12 tribes. And they were sent in to survey what was called the land of promise. And so they do. They go through it. And they go through the entire land. And they bring back even some fruit of the land. And they say, the land is rich in produce. It's filled with milk and honey. But there's a problem we fear the inhabitants. The report was the cities are fortified, the people are strong, and there are giants in the land. And so there's this warrior by the name of Caleb of Judah. And, and Caleb, one of the 12 spies, said, let's go up and take it. We can overcome it. According to Numbers 13, 31 through 33, but the men who had gone up with him said, we're not able to go up against the people. They're stronger than we and they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, descendants of Anak, came from the giants. We're like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Yeah, it's got milk. It's got honey. They brought back a cluster of grapes that took two men carrying it on a pole. That's a symbol Israel has, and some of you have seen it to this day. It's a land of milk and honey. But here's your problem. It's filled with giants, and we can't do it. We can't go in. We can't take it. God was upset. And all that God had done for them all that time, providing in every way, they still doubted. They still feared man. God had done things for them that never had been done. And they still doubted. And that's why he says in verse 11, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Numbers 14, 21 through 20, 23, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of the men who saw my glory and the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their forefathers. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. You're not going to see it. Contrary to today's mentality, God doesn't ignore, ignore unbelief and resistance. God's Anger and grief over their disobedience became wrath at their hardness. And because of this, he excluded them from the promised land. He says, they shall not enter my rest. They shall not have a permanent and safe dwelling place. Even after they did enter in, read your Bible and you'll see that there's a history of oppression. They're bullied. They're ruled by the Gentiles. 
they never had the complete rest. They simply inhabited but never had the full blessings that they would have had had they been trusting God in the way that they should have. And finally, verse 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who having heard rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now, with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who didn't obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Beware, brethren, lest, lest you have notice an evil heart of unbelief. And evil speaks of wicked, something that is bad. Unbelief is simply the absence of faith. He says, lest any of you have an evil heart of unbelief in departing. The word departing means to stand aloof or stand away. It speaks of rejecting Christ, having nothing to do with him. Falling away from God is the result of a sinful, unbelieving heart. He's issuing a warning against rejecting what they know is true. You see, no matter how close somebody is to coming to Christ, if they refuse to do so, they exhibit an evil, rebellious heart. Someone said, if you know Scripture is true, obey its revelation of salvation in Jesus Christ. And so to know it is true and to reject it is to reject salvation. And the Hebrews who are aware of the claims of the gospel must not live in unbelief. So he says, verse 13, exhort one another while it's called today. Be faithful to Jesus, not only individually, but collectively. Encourage one another to walk with Jesus Christ. Here's something for you. What kind of friendships do you have? What kind of friendships do you, do you cultivate? Know the difference between ministry and friendship. Friendship is where you are lifting one another up, moving in the same direction. It's like somebody standing shoulder to shoulder with somebody else looking in the same direction. That's a friendship. Ministry is different. Some of us have people we love very deeply, and we love them very deeply, but they're our ministry. I have to pray. There was a time when I'd have to pray before I went to see friends. They were people I loved. But Marie and I, I can still remember pulling up in front of a friend's house and holding her hand and saying, let's pray. Because this guy here claims to know Jesus. I'm not saying he doesn't, but he's not walking with him. And I want him to walk with the Lord. And we would pray. And so I knew the difference between ministry and friendship. And there is a difference. A friend is somebody that you lift up and lifts you up. Ministry is somebody you're there to help to lift up. And we do that. So which one are you? Are you a friend to somebody or are you somebody's ministry? If you're somebody's ministry, ask God to make you into somebody who ministers. And you do that by holding fast to the things of the Lord and be dead serious about it. You see, you can be, according to verse 13, hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. It, 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 is, it is thinking that sin isn't that serious and Jesus really isn't necessary. And what sin is, is, is sin is going to deceive us into believing that we don't know, we don't need to know Jesus Christ. And so he says in verses 14 and 15, you become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. The greatest of sal evidence of salvation is continuance in the Christian life. You see, only believers who maintain unwavering faith in Jesus are really true. And then finally he closes, and we did make it, guys. Here we go. Verse 16. For who, having heard, rebelled, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Whom was he angry forty years uh, with for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned? To whom did he swear that they wouldn't, wouldn't enter his rest? Those who didn't obey. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. God became angry with those who left Egypt. 
because Egypt never left them. The reason their corpses littered the wilderness is they were unbelievers. And in spite of all he had done on their behalf, they continued rebelling against him. I'll close with one last thought. I was a very young Christian when, when the Lord gave me this. And this is a very personal thing to me and I probably can't communicate it well. Because it's one of those deep, deep things that, that the Lord taught me and I, and I can't communicate it well. But I'll try. Jesus was with three of his men on the Mount Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John. And they saw something amazing. And they come down the hill. You all know the story. They come down from this mountaintop experience. And when they come to the bottom of the hill, there's a man who is speaking to Jesus' apostles. When he sees Jesus come, the man approaches Christ and he said, Lord, you need to help me. I have a severely demonized son. And I brought him to your men. And they couldn't cast the demon out. And Jesus begins to speak to him. And Jesus says to him, all things are possible to the one who believes. And the man said this, and this is, this is the verse that God gave me when I was like 23, 24 years old. Lord, I believe. And I'll use the King James. A lot of the early scriptures I memorized with King James. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. I understand that scripture. It's not what I... It's not what I believe. I conceptually believe this. It's that I really don't apply it as if it applies to me. I believe. It's not the belief that I concern myself with. It's the things I don't believe that I need help with. Following Christ is not an easy life. I had a guy tell me one time, I worked with, he said, oh, you took the easy way out. You became a Christian. I thought, you, you, you have to be crazy to think that. Because it's easier to lose your temper than to not lose your temper. It's easier to, to sin than it is to resist, especially if you're in need and you're working somewhere and there's some money there and I sure have a need. My kids are hungry. I'm going to just take it. God will. No, it's, it's, it's easier to do the wrong than to do the right. It's a lot easier. Why? Because it's our nature to do that. We're inclined towards that. And so early on in my walk, and I believe that there must be others in this room that can understand what I'm saying. I had to say that, and I've been saying this for 50 plus years. I believe. Help the areas of unbelief. Lord, I have prayed for other people knowing you would answer my prayer for them. But when I pray for myself, I don't think you're going to answer my prayer for me. Anybody ever understand that? Ever any, Anybody ever pray for somebody saying, I know God will touch you, but how about you? Will God touch you? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. I don't want to be like the children of Israel who have God revealing himself in such marvelous ways and then at the end just walk away with an evil heart of unbelief. I want to go the whole journey with the Lord. I want to step in. I want to enter into the pleasure of the Lord. I want to see his glory. I want to hear the well done. And that's what has kept me going for almost 54 years. That one day, one day, I want to hear him say, well done. Well done, my good, my faithful servant. I don't want to be someone who started out well but did not finish well. I want to finish well. I want to be able to walk in and hand the crowns that the Lord gives to me back to him and say, it's all from you. Thank you so much. Hold fast to your confession. Hold tight. Don't let it go.